So working on this addition at our house, I now have two coats of spackle on the sheetrock. I have one more coat to go. The skim coat, the thin skim coat goes on very thin, very quickly, dries fast. Then after I do that third coat, I need to uh, sand it and then hopefully I'll be able to get to painting it. Hey everybody, this is Bill with Live Simple, Live Free. I'm coming down to the wire with the walls and I'm really getting excited about it to be able to finish this up. So let's get started. So the second coat is already pretty smooth and the third coat will just put the finishing touches on it. But because the second coat is already pretty smooth, sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's had the third coat on it or not. If you don't put the third coat on it, then you'll find after you paint it, it'll pop and you'll see it. So you want to make sure that you've got it on there. So how do I make sure that I cover them all without very carefully expect, inspecting each one to find out whether it's been, whether it's received the third coat or not? This little tool right here, pencil. So now what happens, can you see those X's? Yeah, I put X's on all of them. So now what happens is after I put the third coat on there, it'll cover up that X and you won't be able to see it anymore. So I can tell which ones still need to be done because they will still have an X on it. Now this is one of those seams that I need to put the third coat on it. And you can see a little bit of a line right here, but generally, in flat light like I've got right here when you just look at it straight on it doesn't look bad it looks like I can maybe do a little bit of sanding and be ready to go with it so I always put a light on the side now all of a sudden you can see all of the lines here 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 and you can see how bad it really is and how much it still needs uh, the third coat the idea here being that the third coat will be so smooth that it won't have to be sanded at all. I can never quite achieve that. I always need to sand it a little bit, but I want to try to do that the best I can uh, to make it as smooth as possible. Now in the first two coats, I was leaving a little bit of thickness on here. When I put the mud on, I left it, you know, a little, a little bit thicker because I needed to fill in all the holes and all the gaps. For this third coat, that's not the goal. For the third coat, the goal is just to fill in all of the low spots. So I'll put it on and then when I scrape it off, I try to completely scrape all of it off and that will fill in the low spots. I'll show you what I mean. Notice I'm making it, each coat gets a little wider. Okay, so now I take my Y blade, I think it's a 10 inch. And just like before, I want to taper up the sides. I'm going to taper up the right side first. Then the left side, now up the middle. Like I said, what I'm trying to do here is completely scrape all the mud off. And you might be able to see right here, this is where that line is, and this is pretty much scraped clean. And this over here is filled in a little bit. And that's what makes it smooth after it dries. And you want to have it pretty much of an angle like this, not like that. That angle will make it smooth. Just like that. Now there's just the slightest little bit left right here and that'll easily sand out. So I want to go all the way around the whole room doing this third coat, putting it on scraping it off as much as I can.
Okay, so now here you can see, just like the second coat, I do the third coat, I only do one side and then I let it dry and then I do the other side. This side has already had the third coat, it's nice and smooth, it's tapered out nicely right here. This side only has a second coat, notice that it's not as wide as this one and it's got the X to let me know it hasn't been done yet. So now I'll do the third skim coat on this side. Then I make it a little bit wider. Then I'm going to taper the edge first. Then I come down the corner. And I'm trying to scrape off as much of this as I can. And there we go. Now that little section, or this, this here is hardly going to need any sanding at all because it's very smooth. And that's how I do the inside corners for the third coat. So I've now finished the third skim coat all the way around the whole room. So now it's time to start sanding. Sanding is the part of the job that everybody hates. It's strenuous, it's dirty, it's nasty. Nobody likes it. And so that's why I strive to make the uh, spackle as I put it on as smooth as possible. And so, because I have honed my spackling abilities to the highest levels of excellence and professionalism, I have almost completely eliminated the need for sanding. Now there are several different types of sanders and ways to sand. There's this one which has a nice handle, it's easy to hold, and then it has a mesh here that you can change out when it gets worn out. You can buy the mesh at different grits, a real coarse or fine. And you can, this is great for big sections. But I usually prefer these. They're sponges wrapped in uh, sandpaper, basically. You can also buy these at different grits. I like this because I can put a pressure on one corner and get one into one little spot, whereas the other one is flat and all you can do is the big walls. So I use this a lot. There's also this one beveled here, which goes into a corner. That way I can use the bevel part here to go into the corner and sand this side without messing up the other side. If I use the square part and put it in there, as I sand this, it's also going to sand a, a, a ridge in, right here. So the bevel part into the corner like that eliminates that. Now there's also something called wet sanding, which I've never done. I don't really know anything about it. I've never seen anybody do it, but apparently it, it uh, greatly reduces the amount of dust. I guess you just soak one of these in water when you sand it. I don't know. I've never done it. I'm comfortable with what I'm doing. I don't really want to experiment with new stuff without somebody else showing me <laughs> how it works. You know, when you work alone like I do, sometimes you don't keep up with the newest techniques that you would if you're working in a big crew. So, but anyway, so this works well for me. That's what I'm going to be using. Now, I always use a drop light when I'm sanding so I can see what I'm doing. When you look at it straight on like this, it looks completely smooth. It looks beautiful. But when you do this, then the light shows off all of the little imperfections. I tried very hard to show you uh, up close what the, the imperfections look like, but for some reason the camera just wouldn't pick it up. So you just have to trust me that there are little imperfections in there, but it's not going to be difficult to sand them out. I got a new corner uh, piece that's, that's bigger, longer than the other one that I showed you. I can use this one for the corner and then use the, this for the big flat sections. 
so that's what I'll be doing. And then of course, because it's it creates a lot of dust, it's really nasty. It gets everywhere. I'll be completely covered with dust by the end. So I'm wearing a mask. A lot of people ask me at various different points why I'm not wearing a mask. Well, as you can see, I wear a mask when it's necessary. Gotta protect my lungs. The biggest thing that I'm working on here is to sand the edge completely flat against the paper. That's where you're going to see the seam the most if it's not sanded properly. And then there are a few imperfections in here as well, but it's mostly just the edges. That's one advantage of this short ceiling is that I can reach the ceiling and reach up into the top corner without putting out any scaffolding or anything like that. So this is real exciting stuff, huh? You get the idea. I just gotta sand the whole room. It's a nasty job, but I gotta do it. <laughs> now when I'm sanding the screw holes here, this has got three coats of mud on it. I do not sand the center until the very end. I'm just going to concentrate on sanding the edges to get them tapered. So I'm putting pressure this way and not in the center. Just like that and then once that's done and all the edges are, are tapered in then I just do one or two swipes in the middle. If you, if you do the whole thing then you could actually get too much off in the center and you'll be able to see the screw holes. But this will completely disappear after it's painted. The ceiling is absolutely the worst because you're not only are you working above your head but you got to push up this way and it uses these muscles back here that you don't usually use. It's really exhausting. Now they do have a pole sander, which is basically one of these, screwed onto the end of a, of a pole like you would use for a, a paint roller where you could reach up and do the whole thing. But that just completely sits flat and you don't have any of the control that I like of being able to push on just one small section. So the pole sander I use sometimes, especially on really tall ceilings, but for the most part, I prefer this. It's just really exhausting. Fortunately, this is a very small ceiling. And it doesn't require much sanding because I did such an excellent job at spackling. Thank you very much. So earlier I mentioned a pole sander 
and I've said that I like these better uh, because I think I could just do a better job. But for the ceiling, it's been a long time since I've done a ceiling and I'm not as young as I used to be. Trying to do this above my head on the ceiling is at this point really difficult for me. So I'm gonna use a pole sander. I didn't have one anymore because I haven't done it in a while. I had to go buy one. So this is a pole sander and it uses this mesh uh, sanding paper. Pushed it in too far and then it wasn't enough to reach the other end. There we go. And then there's this mesh that folds up on the side. And I like to take a knife and cut that mesh off on one side. Just like that. That way I can run this one side, when I'm doing the ceiling, I can run this one side up against the wall and not mess up the wall. If I did it on this side, that would put a, gro a groove in the top of the wall. So I do it that way. <laughs> This is still strenuous on the arms, but not nearly as bad as doing this. <laughs> well, I'm finished with all the sanding. It's looking pretty good. So now I can actually start on the paint. So the first coat is going to be this Valspar primer sealer. It seals the sheetrock for the first coat. Now this was a uh, five gallon bucket that's left over from the renovation flip house that we did last year, last summer. So this can is probably 10 months old maybe. I'm hoping it's still going to be usable and it's not all completely separated inside. So let's see what this looks like. Oh my. I was expecting that to be completely separated. Not even know if it was going to be usable. That doesn't even look like it needs to be mixed after sitting there for 10 months like that. That's amazing. But I am still going to mix it up just to make sure that it's thoroughly mixed and there's nothing sitting in the bottom that needs to be sprayed into the whole bucket. All right, I think I'm good to go. This mixing paddle is usually used for uh, spackle premix. But it works on this paint as well. So now I've finished the primer sealer coat and I'm ready for the final color. And so we will be using Valspar Signature um, interior 
latex. This is a color. It's satin. This is a color that Elizabeth chose. It's called nebulous white. So we'll see what this looks like. Basically looks the same as the uh, as the primer coat. It's just slightly off white. Now when I first started putting on this final color, I put it on and it was wet and it was light. It was almost the same color as the seal uh, coat. But now that it's dry, I see that it's actually considerably darker. It's got kind of a gray tint to it and I really like it much better. I thought that the, the color of the seal coat is just so bright and stark. Uh, I, I like the more subdued kind of grayish color to this nebulous white. See, when it goes on, it looks the same. But then after it dries, it darkens. Well, I'm all finished with the paint. This room is actually starting to look like it's a room that belongs to my house instead of looking like a incomplete construction project. So the next step is to put in the flooring. It's going to be laminate flooring like this. It's a white with a kind of a light gray marble. I don't know how well you can see that, but um, that will be on the next video. So. <clears throat> Tune into the next video to see how I do the flooring, the laminate flooring. Thanks for watching, everybody. Live simple, live free. You be blessed.